Hey everybody, it is Matt Weaver here, and today I have uh, Aaron Lipkin with us as well. And Aaron, Aaron is a friend uh, from Israel who lives in Oprah, which is up in the uh, central highlands of Israel, uh, in the biblical heartland. And um, it's an honor to have him. We've had him on several times before, but it's an honor to have him on the, the program again. So uh, nice to see you, Aaron. Nice to see you too, Pastor Matthew. Great being with you. So let's discuss a little bit, um, I guess, some of the conversations we had up till now. One of the conversations was about Exodus and Israelites coming into the land before the Exodus. The other conversation we had was footprint structures, and uh, ultimately we discussed the altar site on Mount Ebal. And I would like to, uh, I guess, go a little bit further, because there has been some more um, or I should say it this way, Dr. Scott Stripling, who was, who was leading the archaeological side of um, going through, again, the sifting piles, I guess, that was left by Zertzal, found this little lead tablet. So I think we discussed it briefly, but we didn't actually go into what were the findings, what was, what was the story. So if you would like to, uh, we'll turn the time over to you and, and, and help us understand what, what he discovered. Okay, so so first of all, we need to talk about the site itself for those that haven't heard uh, the uh, podcast that we did about Joshua's altar. So uh, just to recap, in 1982, a, an atheist professor from the Haifa University by the name of Adam Zertal discovers a, a structure that he doesn't identify at first. And then after that, uh, he understands that he discovered an Israelite altar on Mount Ebal, and he immediately connects that to the story in Deuteronomy 11, Deuteronomy 27, where Moses commands the Israelites to build a, a stone altar on Mount Ebal as part of a ceremony of curses, curses and blessings, uh, which Joshua um, performs in Joshua 8, uh, building an, an altar on Mount Ebal and uh, convening the whole nation on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ibal to do a, a renewal of the Sinaitic covenant uh, in the land of Israel. So this is a very important event and finding a structure that uh, that possibly connects to the ceremony uh, was really a, an earth shattering discovery uh, during the 1980s. Adam Zertal uh, was uh, faced a very strong opposition from the academic world. Uh, which didn't really, um, I would say, uh, cope with this discovery, but rather ignored it, uh, tried to uh, um, uh, put Adam Zertal in a place that wasn't legitimate. And uh, and that really uh, made Zertal very, very... Um, uh, um, uh, What's the word in English? Uh, it, it, it was it was it was sad and uh, and 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 uh, but continued on trying to spread the word of this uh, discovery. Um, Adam Zertal passed away in two thousand and fifteen, and until today, um, unlike every other major archaeological discovery, a final report was never written on this discovery, uh, because basically to to put it very bluntly. Because of the academic world uh, not agreeing with Zertal's assessment, um, they they didn't give him any grants. Uh, he didn't have any funding to continue the research of the the uh, the the altar and the final report. So the good news is that uh, after uh, you know 30, 40 years of of that that have passed since, uh, we were able to achieve a large donation, and as we speak right now. Uh, a final report is being written by several archaeologists that uh, that are a part of Adam Zertal's team. And hopefully next year we're going to have a big conference uh, here in Israel uh, presenting the final report uh, with all the different sections, the bones, the pottery, uh, the, um, the uh, special artifacts that were found there, the structure itself. Uh, and there's hopefully going to be a lot of things going on there, and uh, and we, we have a lot to look forward to. Um, you know, jumping to the year 2019, um, Dr. Scott Stripling from the Associates of Biblical Research, and yours truly, 
uh, both initiated a special operation uh, where we extracted the archaeological dump dump that Adams et al. created in the 1980s uh, in order to re-examine it, to possibly find things that Adams and Zertal missed uh, in the 1980s excavation. And the reason for that is that Adams and Zertal didn't use uh, the techniques that are being used today in major archaeological excavations. For example, wet sifting, uh, metal detecting, uh, flotation of organic uh, material. These are things that Adams or Tal didn't do, and uh, Scott Stripling did. And so um, I was able to extract the uh, material. Uh, uh, Scott Stripling came with his crew in December of 2019. And in January, um, Scott found a small piece of lead in the dump. And um, after sending it to, uh, to be examined, both in the Hebrew University and later on in the uh, Czech Republic, um, um, they were able to find ancient Hebrew script, uh, both inside and outside the lead tablet. We're talking about a piece of lead that was folded and um, they tried to open it and it started breaking. So they stopped and they used special um, CAT scan technique called tomography to read the inside of the tablet, and uh, about uh, eight months ago, a peer-reviewed article came out uh, on this uh, inscription inside. And um, there is a, a there is a on the one side you have Professor Gelshon Galil from uh, Israel that claims that there are forty six letters um, in that inscription inside um, a very terrible curse in Hebrew. Uh, and I'm talking about ancient Hebrew script. We're not talking about the first temple uh, script that everybody knows. You like Paleo we're talking, Hebrew? Talking, we're talking about Sinaitic Hebrew, okay. uh, also called by some hieroglyphic Hebrew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, every letter is a picture, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's an alphabet. And so Gershon Galil claims that there is a 46 letter curse. Um, and people can can look for that curse on the internet. It's it's also inside the, in the uh, peer reviewed article. Uh, Dr. Peter Vanderven, who uh, wrote the uh, report with Gershon Galil, claims that there is there are less letters in that inscription. I believe um, maybe fifty or sixty percent of the amount of letters that Gershon Galil claims. Uh, he's more skeptic, but still, even in the most skeptical um, uh, view, uh, the, the name of God, uh, the, the three-letter word of the name of God, YHW, appears several times on the inside of the inscription. The word Aru, uh, cursed in Hebrew, uh, is also, also appears uh, on the inside inscription. So both scholars believe that there is there is an inscription inside, um, and uh, and they wrote a peer reviewed article about it. Um, the uh, because it's peer reviewed, there were several other scholars that went through the information. Two of these scholars, the professors, agreed with Galil and Vanderven. One didn't, uh, and so we have several scholars that agreed on on the fact that we have a lead. A tablet with an inscription on it, um, and uh, and so the, and and so this was published eight months ago, um, and as we speak right now, uh, there is another peer-reviewed article that's being written by Dr. Peter Vanderven and another uh, partner, uh, and they are going to be. It's going to cover the outside inscription because there are two sides to the lead tablet mm -hmm. each side has uh, a curse inscription on it both ins both inscriptions are very similar to each other um and uh, and so that's going to be probably um, um advertised um or published uh, next next year so so all in all we have two peer reviewed article that came out there and uh, we need to talk about the reaction. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so first of all, um, the reaction uh, was. Uh, um, by the way, and I have to. Under I have, people have people need to understand. We talked. We talked about Adams Ertal, 
not publishing a, a final report um, on the discovery of the altar. And what that caused is a, a, a halt of the academic discussion on the altar. Uh, and that's not good. I mean, what you do in the academic world is you present a theory uh, and you have counter theories from other professors, and then you have a discussion, a dialogue, um, and, and it continues on. Books are written on it. Um, more research is being done. It's it's a whole, it's a process in the academic world. And unfortunately, it didn't happen with Joshua's altar. Um, and so when, when the peer-reviewed article came out on the lead tablet, uh, you started started receiving negative uh, uh, um, ideas and, and criticism from other scholars uh, who wrote other uh, other uh, uh, articles on the lead tablet. And so I had many people come to me and say, Aaron, you know, uh, Galil and Peter Vanderbilt are saying that there is a, an ancient Hebrew curse in the tablet, but these guys, this professor and this professor, uh, says that there's nothing on the tablet and that it's not even a lead tablet. Uh, and I was really happy to hear that. And, and everybody was like, why are you happy? And I said, because there's a there's a dialogue going on. There's a discussion. It's part of the academic process. And that's good. Um, and so uh, that's 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 going on uh, after the peer reviewed article that was uh, published. And we're probably going to see more of that discussion going on, especially when the second peer reviewed article is going to be published, because uh, you know, when you speak to to Peter Vanderven, for example, um, he regrets um, writing the peer-reviewed article uh, about the inner inscription before publishing the one on the outer inscription, because the inner inscription relies on a technique of X of of, of CAT scanning and tomography. You can't see the letters uh, with your eyes. Uh, you have to use this special technique, and and so you have to rely on it. You don't really see it, and so there people can can argue that it's not really there, etc. Um, the outer inscription is out there. You can see it. You can see the letters, uh, and and they're more evident. So so I, I assume that that both Scott and Peter uh, would have wanted the the uh, peer-reviewed article on the outside inscription to be uh, to be published, uh, but that's that's what happened, and and so they're they're moving on with with the articles, and I would say that uh, the the last uh, discussion about it was uh, Professor Aaron Meyer from the uh, uh, Bar Ilan University, I believe, um, that uh, claimed that the tablet is not actually a a lead tablet with an inscription on it. Uh, that there that there is no inscription on it at all, and that uh, it's actually a fishing sink um, that was left there sometime during um, uh, the, the, during history. Um, the other claim is that there's no way of dating the uh, the the lead the piece of lead because it was wasn't found. In, a, in the context of an archaeological excavation. For those of us that are listening to this discussion, when you do an archaeological excavation, um, you basically dig in layers and, and you document everything that you find. So if you find something in, in the Roman period layer, then that artifact is from the Roman period, um, and, it's, and so on and so forth. When you find a small uh, piece of lead inside an archaeological dump, then there's it's not in context. So you can't really claim that it's from the time of the Israelite period or the Iron Age one or whatever. Uh, and so these are the, the major claims of Professor Aaron Meyer. Uh, and um, there was ob obviously a response by Peter Vanderven and Scott Stripling to that criticism. Uh, and so th this is this is the dialogue that we that we want. This is the discussion that we want. Uh, if if people would ignore those peer reviewed articles, then our uh, work was was going uh, in vain. It's it, it, this is exactly what we want. Uh, so if people want to hear the responses of Scott and Peter, 
Uh, they're out there on the internet. Um, I'll just say very briefly that, um, first of all, claiming that you can't date the lead tablet is uh, is uh, is is not accurate because when you excavate an archaeological tell where you have many layers from different periods of time, um, then then finding an object out of context is problematic because it can uh, belong to any of the layers in that archaeological tell, uh, whereas Joshua's altar is a one or actually a two layer site. Uh, and both both layers are from the Iron Age, early Iron Age period, which is the Israelite period. Nothing else happened on that site. It's not a city. It's not a town. It's a remote location on on the um, on the slopes of Mount Ibal. And so, really, any object that would be, that would be found in the vicinity of the altar has to come from the um, the uh, early Iron Age period, uh, very similar to the um, operation going on near Temple Mount. Uh, I'm sure that our many of our uh, uh, listeners and viewers know that the Islamic Waqf on Temple Mount destroyed um, a, a lot of archaeology under Temple Mount to build a mosque, and the, the debris were thrown down into a nearby valley. Um, and so there is an archaeological operation going on for the past few years of going through those debris and date and basically finding artifacts. And all the artifacts that were found uh, were from the uh, Second Temple period, most of them. And this is obviously from a city of like Jerusalem. So if if um, everybody acknowledges that, that that's legitimate, then there's no reason why... Uh, a two-layer site like Joshua's altar, all the things that were found there are from the same period of the altar itself. So that's one claim against uh, Aaron, Professor Aaron Meyer. And the second claim is that Aaron Meyer says that 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 fishing sink um, that 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 he thinks is similar to the one that we that we, the, the lead tablet that we found on Mount Ibal. So there is something like 300 fishing sinks that were found in Israel, um, out of which um, there are two types from those 300. Um, 299 of them are one, one, one type, and one is the other type. And Aaron Meyer claims that the lead tablet that we found on Mount Ibal uh, it belong, is, is, is similar to that one fishing sink that was found in Israel. Um, and uh, and so that's that's really a very, very slim uh, you know. argument, especially when you ask yourself, why would you find a fishing sink on the central mountain ridge of Israel, uh, far away from any uh, body of water, yeah. Mediterranean or Galilee yep. Sea or anything? There's... The, uh, why would would someone deposit the fishing sink um, on in that place? Anyway, so so the the uh, the uh, discussion, the dialogue is going on, and uh, and this is really this is good, and and we should continue following it. Um, and uh, you know what what we should really ask ourselves is, and, and and by the way, you know Aaron Meyer says that there's no writing on the inside of the tablet. Um, which is which again corresponds with the difficulty of trying to analyze a script that you don't have any access to because it's inside. So hopefully the second peer-reviewed article on the outside inscription would uh, prove without any doubt to Aaron Meyer and other professors that there is inscription on the lead tablet itself. Uh, our viewers have to understand that finding such an inscription is 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 really earth shattering mm -hmm. in the academic world. It's something that 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 doesn't correspond with the basic uh, understandings of history of 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 sociology of the development of of a script uh, in general and that the development of script in the uh, Israelite culture. Um, you know, one of the claims is that that. Because there wasn't any script, any script found uh, in this Israelite culture ever, 
um, that's a, that's the proof that the Israelites could not have received the uh, Torah on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. Uh, they could not have uh, uh, transferred the traditions uh, of the Bible um, through the generations. Um, and therefore, um, the Bible was is, is a much later document that was invented by the priests of Jerusalem at the time of Hezekiah or something like that. Um, finding script on Mount Ibal uh, during the 13th century uh, BC is something that changes everything, and and mo and most professors are shatter are, are are shivering from fear. Um, of the uh, ramifications of such a, a discovery. Hmm. Well, that's great. Um, I mean, just from my perspective, if you're looking at like uh, ramifications, I mean, this is technically, if it is what the claim is, I mean, this is direct connection to the story of Exodus, which up till now, everyone tends to say, well, there's no evidence for it. So there's there's a lot going on with this discovery from a academic standpoint, uh, it has, yeah, like you say, earth shattering ramifications. And it also speaks to um, the story of the Bible being true, that Israelites were in the land. It reinforces the age of that, that, you know, that there is Israelites in the land going all the way back into um, the Iron Age or, you know, Iron Age one and and before that, of course. But so it's 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 really it's really a big deal. Um, speak a little it's, bit. By so the way, since, it's, it's, sorry, go ahead. By the way, it's, it's also a big deal in terms of the identification of Joshua's altar as Joshua's altar, mm -hmm. um, because again, most views of, of uh, that are, that are critical of the historicity of the Bible claim that Joshua never existed, that the uh, the story of the ceremony of blessings and curses never existed, never happened. Um, and and so finding such a, an inscription um, at the site of Joshua's altar um, proves, without any doubt, that the that the that the structure is Israelite, um, that it's cultic in 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 uh, in in its character, that that uh, that it was uh, important. Um, th th these are all things that um, strengthen the identification, and that's another problem because if like you know like Adam Zertal said if this is Joshua's altar then Joshua existed and Moses existed the exodus happened yeah. the there is a there is a there is a, a, a house of cards yep. or a domino a domino yep. effect that uh, that is created from this uh, discovery and and as I said people are very afraid of it yeah absolutely so in in the in the meantime, unfortunately, and I don't know how this has has transpired during you know the last 20, 30 years since the discovery initially, but there has been an increased seemingly effort to vandalize the site to to somehow destroy evidence by um, other people living in the region. And that is of great concern for all of humanity because this is a historical site. Um, I mean, what I know you're kind of spearheading uh, efforts to try to raise awareness to people. Hey, listen, this needs this site needs protection. This site needs to be, um, you know, guarded and and watched over. And it's a politically sensitive one for the Israeli government because technically, it's not in their jurisdiction. Ish, it's close, but so I guess talk to that a little bit and uh, and what's been happening in that regard. Okay, um, so just. To be very brief about it, the um, if, you, if you look at the map of Israel, you'll see that uh, that Israel is divided into two parts. One part is the areas that were um, that, that 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 are that are the basically the formal state of Israel um, from 1948 till 1967. The second part uh, is areas that were. Uh, liberated by the Israeli army in the Six Day War after 1967, known as Judea and Samaria uh, and Gaza, known as the uh, West Bank by some people, uh, those that oppose it called call it the occupied territories. Um, so these two areas um, are, are 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 west of the Jordan River, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. 
and uh, both areas are under Israeli control. Uh, however, um, the areas that were liberated in 1967 haven't been annexed to Israel formally. Um, so Israel has control over them. Uh, Jews um, live in Judea and Samaria, which is the biblical heartland of Israel. Um, and, but the problem is that unlike archaeological sites uh, in Israel, formal Israel, which are under the antiquity authorities, are preserved by the Israeli government, um, many of these archaeological sites are um, are national parks that tourists visit on a daily basis. Unlike those sites, uh, the archaeological sites in Judea and Samaria are under the supervision of the Israeli army. And the problem with, with that is that the Israeli army, when you go to the Israeli army, um, their priority is to, to keep um, safety and security. They're not archaeologists. Um, and so when you have um, to prioritize between security and archaeology, uh, archaeology takes the second uh, level or, or the third priority or the fourth priority. And the, and the army is, is, is um, busy with keeping the safety and fighting the terrorism. Um, and so, and when you look in Judea and, at Judea and Samaria, the biblical heartland of Israel, there are thousands of ancient sites. Um, I would say that maybe one or two percent of them were researched, uh, but the rest weren't, and they're just lying there uh, waiting to be researched. Unfortunately, the army doesn't have the manpower to 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 protect them. And so what you what you're seeing is several things. First of all, robbery. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Arabs living in Judea and Samaria um, are spending a lot of time uh, in these ancient sites, robbing them, trying to find coins, ancient artifacts that they can sell um, and uh, make a living out of it. Um, and, and that really increased during the, the COVID period. And, uh, and now uh, there's also a lot of robbery going on. I'm actually part of a WhatsApp group of archaeologists that um, is uh, reporting uh, these robberies. And I'm seeing these robberies on a daily basis. And, and our, our, our viewers mm -hmm. need to understand that an archaeological site that's being robbed is an archaeological site that cannot be researched. Um, mm -hmm. The layers uh, are all mixed up, um, and artifacts that that could have been found by archaeologists, researched, written articles about, and and then putting them in museums, are being sold in the black market to some someone and put uh, uh, without any research, and they're being kept in a in the living room of someone on an exhibit, on an illegal exhibit. Um, and that's that's a big loss for not just for Israeli history and culture, uh, but also for the, the the culture or the history of humankind. Yeah. So so this is going on. So this is one type of, of damage that we're seeing, robbery. Um, and uh, the second uh, the second thing we're seeing is a deliberate attempt by uh, Muslim Arabs uh, in Judea and Samaria. Uh, to erase the uh, any any connection between the Jewish people and uh, the land of Israel. Uh, so what you're basically seeing is archaeology being used as a weapon. Um, every time we Jews find you know a lead tablet or when we find uh, the altar, um, we just we don't we don't just research it objectively because it's part of our heritage. We're happy about it. We say, you know, this lead tablet or this altar or this city um, uh, prove our connection to this land. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem because when you have uh, uh, Muslims who are trying to erase any connection between uh, the Jews and this land, who claim yeah. that this is an Islamic land uh, and that the Jews don't have any right to it, um, then then what what can they do in order to strengthen that uh they they destroy those uh, those sites they try to prevent access from Jews to reaching it um and uh, and 
and so on and so forth. So, so that's what we have been seeing also in Israel. Just two days ago, um, a, the Palestinian Authority um, paved a road that uh, destroyed an archaeological site from the Second Temple period near the city of, of Samaria mm. or Sebastia. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, when I when I go to Joshua's altar, um, uh, just uh, when I went there on December, for example, uh, what I saw horrified me. I saw um, um, graffiti on the walls of the altar. I saw tires that were burnt inside the altar, um, I saw the stones of the outer walls of the altar uh, that were pushed inside in order to destroy the structure itself. Um, and, and this, you, you see that, and, and the graffiti is flags of the PLO and, and, uh, and the word in Arabic, uh, Palestine. So, yeah. so you, the, the people that went there, wanted to to take vengeance against the Jews and how how did they do it they went to a site that was seen as a holy biblical site for Jews and Christians by the way yeah and uh, and they defiled it and, and yeah. that's that's their Islamic mindset of, of trying to um uh trying to uh, uh, what to put shame on the on the enemy to to try and show the enemy that uh, they are stronger or whatever that's kind of like their their the way that they are thinking so so this 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 is this is really the situation in many important sites but, but Joshua's altar is the dearest to me yeah. and um, I, I, right after that uh, that desecration uh, the israeli army sent a group of archaeologists to uh, try to uh, renovate the altar they replaced these the stones with the graffiti on it they took the tires out uh, they they rebuilt the ramp that, that goes up to the altar uh, and so when i went back there after the the fixing i was really happy to see that the altar was in in a good shape so um um this situation is not going to change unfortunately this is going to keep on going the israeli government uh, is now busy with a war going on. Mm -hmm. And so archaeology is now even taking less and less uh, of the attention. Uh, the Israeli army in Judea and Samaria is right now working uh, hard on, on uh, taking down terrorism, Islamic terrorism. So the army is also busy. Um, and, and so I'm not, I'm not uh, optimistic. But... Um, at least with with Joshua's altar, um, there is improvement. Um, I go there every week, once a week, um, to to make sure that the structure is okay, that it's standing, that there's no um, damage done to it. Um, our viewers need to understand that the altar wasn't the, the site of the altar wasn't excavated fully. Uh, there is still parts that that need to be excavated. And uh, we need to make sure that eventually that will happen because there is so much more to discover there. And yeah. who knows what's there? Who knows what else is there? Especially with the modern techniques, because I mean, it was it was just parts of the dump, not the entire dump that was even searched, plus modern tools and excavations. I mean, if, a, if you would go a full scale excavation, you would probably find more things. And this is all That's over right. Israel. Like you said, uh, and that is a risk, unfortunately, I guess anywhere. Um, archaeology, if it's pillaged, if it's if it's if things are stolen from it, that story is gone forever. Right. And archaeology is all about they can only really state what they find. And when these things aren't in their context, then it's really kind of pointless. Uh and it's incredibly sad from a uh you know, human history standpoint, not even a, a religious one, just from a human history standpoint, when things are destroyed like this, you know, you lose the story. You can no longer tell that story and convey that to generations of people. And that fuels some of the, you know, ide ideological conflicts that we see in the world today. And I guess I'm going to segue here just for a few minutes into the whole Gaza war. You know, one of the, I guess, questions, and this is, you know, part of our transition uh, even for myself, I grew up very removed from the Jewish world, very removed from uh, Israel. Um, of course, Christian, uh, grow up in biblical narrative and things of that nature. 
but going to Israel and seeing archaeology and the the history connect with the people, connect with the book, uh, was life changing for me. And uh, you know, it's one of those questions. Like from my perspective, I have a view or a a a concept, I guess, of why the world persecute per- persecutes the Jews, but to a modern extent, like what we see in the UN, the resolutions against Israel. And if you go back in the hundred years, of course, the Holocaust and the horrors like that, if you go before then, you know, the, um, what's the word, the programs, I think, and, and the, and the inquisition and just, you know, why is the world so focused on the Jewish people? You know, and, and I guess a lot of people forget that the, the is Israel was formed in, by international consent because of what happened in the Holocaust, that there's a place that Jews can go where they can defend themselves to be safe. So that was an internationally accepted reality. But ever since they have been allowed back into their ethnic homeland, there has still been ongoing persecution and pressure from the neighbors, from people inside, and from all the international community, which really puts Israel in a tough spot. So what is your kind of you know, five minute perspective, it's probably not enough time to discuss uh, a lot of this, but what is your five minute perspective of why this happens? Well, first of all, as, as someone who, who speaks in churches in, in, you know, mostly in the United States, but also all over the world, um, I always tell, say to my fellow Jews here in Israel that the world is not against us. Um, I know millions of Christians who love Israel, who support the Jewish people, who identify with Israel and in in, in our war against evil. Um, this is this is something that I, I try to share with my friends and encourage them. Uh, you know, just uh, about a month ago, there was a huge demonstration in Brazil. Uh, you saw hundreds of thousands of Brazilians uh, uh, marching the streets. Of, of uh, I believe it was uh, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, I'm not sure, um, in support of Israel. The former president of Brazil came on the stage with his Isra- with an Israeli flag and, and waved it in, in, in the air. Uh, it's, not, it's not correct to say that the world is against us. Um, and so you have to understand who is against us, who is, who is, who is persecuting us, and why. And I think that you know we don't have a lot of time. This is a very yep. deep uh, uh, issue, and and also you know we're just about to celebrate Purim, um, and you know there's the story of Haman and and he wanting to persecute the Jews and destroying them in one day, as the scroll of Esther says. Um, so so this is this is something that we're you know we're 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 going to celebrate the the. Um, the, the 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 way that God saved the Jewish people during the time of the Persian period, um, and and yet remember that just a few months ago, uh, thirteen hundred Jews were were massacred uh, in the near the Gaza Strip uh, by uh, by Muslims. So this is this is you know we're we're, we're we kind of we're reliving, reliving the Holocaust in, in again in a certain way, and so. Why why is this happening? And I you know I'm just going to talk about two factors, um, one being um, the uh, replacement theology. Um, you know when we look at history, we see that uh, uh, the major enemy of, of the Jewish people was uh, was Christians. Mm-hmm. Um, you know you saw crusades, you saw uh, constant uh, persecution of Jews in Europe by by Christians, and the reason why they persecuted Jews is because um, they believe the Jews killed Jesus, and because they believe that Christianity um, replaced uh, Judaism, replaced the Jewish people. Um, and when you have a replacement theology, uh, you're basically saying that something is not needed anymore. <laughs> and, and if something is not needed anymore, then then the next step is to throw it away, uh, or kill it, or or yeah. make it vanish. Uh, and so that's that's re- replacement theology leads to anti-Semitism and persecution. Um, Christianity has changed since, and uh, like I said, I go to to churches uh, who love the Israel and the Jewish people, uh, Christians that don't believe in, in replacement theology anymore, and that's a big healing, I believe, in Christianity. Uh, but it didn't happen in Islam. Hmm. Islam uh, believes in what I call a double Mac. 
uh, double Mac, meaning uh, we didn't just replace Judaism, we replaced Christianity. Mm. Uh, we are the, we are the 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 true religion. And so when that when that happens, uh, then then there is persecution of of Jews and Christians wherever Islam is in control. Mm. And so and and what we saw in in October on October seventh. Uh, is that type of persecution. It's a persecution that is propelled by religion, by Islam. Uh, when you ask the people that did it, why did they do it? They didn't they will they will not say we did it because we wanted to liberate Palestine. They say they will tell you that we did it for Allah. We did it because this is jihad. This is the 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 uh, the commandment that that is laid upon us as Muslims. Why did we rape women? Because it says in the Quran that we need to 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 put fear in the hearts of our enemies. Um, why did we behead babies? Why did we kill uh, children in the eyes of their uh, their parents or yeah. the opposite? Uh, and so on and so forth. This is a religious deed, yeah. and and it's and and it's been going on, you know, for for many years uh, here in Israel. Uh, and and unfortunately, I don't. I'm not a prophet, but I, I see this happening uh, also in Europe. Uh, this will this will this will be against Christians and Jews living there, and eventually also in America. Um, this is one type of persecution. Uh, the second type of persecution, I believe, comes from wokeism. Um, you know, when you have a, a an idea in the woke system that uh, that you have indigenous people and and you have and 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 the white people are the colonizers they're the evil people um and so when they look at israel they see the arabs as the indigenous people here and uh and us jews as the colonizers the the people that came from uh you know from europe and right. from other other countries to to take over the the natives uh and so um, when you look at what's going on and you see a strong Israel that is is fighting in Gaza and killing uh, thousands of terrorists, Islamic terrorists that just butchered our women and children, um, um, and 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 we're we're winning, we're really winning. We're we're doing an amazing work uh, in an impossible area that has both a, an upper city and a lower city underground. Um, it, it, it's ridiculous, ridiculously how hard it is, but we're, we're able to do it. We're winning against evil. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking and we're seeing people in universities like, like, like Harvard and Yale uh, that are supporting Hamas and what right. they did against yeah. Israel. How do you, how do you explain that? Insane. Well, the reason for that is that the people there are woke. They, they think that, that the Jews don't belong in Israel, that they don't have any connection to the land, um, and that we're just, you know, uh, colonizers, and that the Palestinians are the natives, they're the indigenous, and we are uh, manipulating them, we are, are using them, whereas the situation is totally different. We are the indigenous people. There's so, there, there's so, so much history to prove that, that we were, were thrown out of this country. We are the indigenous people. And the Palestinians are the ones that that invaded Israel in the last few centuries, but that doesn't matter uh, yeah. because again you have uh, identity politics and and wokeism etc. This is just two examples. Uh, there's uh, there's obviously a lot of more of of that uh, yeah. uh, all all around. Um, I believe that uh, that uh, but but I have to say something. I believe that that. Jewish persecution. I'm going to say something very problematic at the end of our podcast. Um, Jewish persecution has been going on for thousands of years, um, and and you know, thank God, none of my relatives died in the Holocaust. We didn't experience anti-Semitism personally in anyone from our family. So it's easy for me to talk. Obviously, if I had a relative, then I wouldn't be speaking so yeah. detached emotionally yeah, but sure. but per, but but Jewish persecution is is a a I would say a physical power um that that um drives Jews back to their Jewish identity 
mm. that drives Jews back to the land of Israel. Um, and 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 you know when you look at the ramifications of the October seventh attack, uh, so obviously we have hostages. We have thirteen hundred people that got killed. Um, uh, we have a war going on. So there's a lot of bad things happening, but there, but but many good things came out of it. Um, if you came to Israel before October seventh. Uh, the Jewish nation was uh, really divided and uh, fighting each other. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if the October 7th attack didn't happen, I don't know what would have happened in Israel after October 7th. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it. Maybe it's another another mm-hmm. topic for another podcast. But yep. uh, we were we were in the worst situation internally inside the Jewish people yeah. here in Israel, prior to October 7th. When October 7th happened, um, all, all parts of the Jewish nation understood that no matter what they are, if they're secular, if they're national religious, if they're orthodox, orthodox if they're ultra-orthodox, they would be killed because they're Jews. And so the, the Arabs that attacked us basically united us. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, many Jews are, 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 going, are going back to their Jewish roots. Um, you know, many soldiers wanted to wear the tzitzit, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the fringes of the, wearing these strings on the fringes of, of, of the garments as written in the Torah, because they believe that that's basically bringing God to be with them while they're fighting. And we're talking about people that didn't believe in God and hmm. people would put tefillin on phylacteries for the first time. Um, so many, many things happened because of that anti-Semitism. You see a, 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 a people, Jews from all over the world, um, opening these these uh, immigration files to come to Israel because they want to, to be here. They want to fight for the Jewish people in the Jewish land. So... The reason why I'm saying that is because anti-Semitism has, I'm not justifying it, I know it sounds terrible, but anti-Semitism has a a driving power that unites the Jewish people and connects them to their uh, Bible and to their land. Hmm. And and I think that 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 is something that we're seeing and something that we're going to continue seeing. Um, We have to understand that there is a Haman uh, right now that is living in Tehran that is developing nuclear weapons to destroy the Jewish people um, and that the story of Purim is is uh, the story of, of, of the scroll of Esther um, is is being repeated mm-hmm. I, I wonder if you know that the name Khomeini you know Ayatollah Khomeini and the Khamenei they're all Haman's you know Khamenei Khomeini it's all Haman it's 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 mm-hmm. it's Finally, wow. how history repeats itself. Crazy. So, so yeah. So, uh, this is going to be our modern battle against persecution, wow. and I trust God that uh, that He is with us and uh, that He will uh, help us. And uh, and I think that uh, people that are listening to us need to to make a decision where they stand. They stand with the Jewish people, uh, with the nation of Israel. Um, and 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 to support us and to 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 pressure the um, American administration that is right now working very strongly against, uh, for a ceasefire that would basically cause uh, Israel to lose the war. Um, and and people people need to understand that we're fighting. We're not just fighting our war. We're fighting your war as well. Um, and if we lose this war, the whole Western world. Judeo-Christian civilization uh, will will start losing their their battles against the the evils of of, uh, of Islam. So um, people really need to step up and and support us. Hmm. Yeah, that's amazing, amazing thoughts. I mean, I, I, maybe amazing isn't the right word, but I guess I'll 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 finish with this. I remember two years ago we were in Israel, just my family, and we had were visiting friends down in Gush uh, Gush Etzion. And uh, they invited us to Memorial Day celebration. So we were there. Um, and I just, you know, it really was something to, from a, from an American standpoint, I had, of course, had, we have our Memorial Day celebrations here. But from our perspective, 
sitting there realizing you have this morning time where you're going through all these people that these that people in that group knew who had given their lives for the cause of of Israel and then they turn to celebration and and there is joy but just i had never really seen something like that and it and in and, and in all of that it was connected to their ancestry their roots you know ethnically connected to the land to the bible uh it really is something uh, but anyway, I know you need to run. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, God bless you. God bless you. God bless America and pray for Israel. Amen.